Good morning to you, members and friends of Congregational Church of the Valley. We're very glad that you're with us through the miracle of media on this day, on this August 9th, 2020. We hope that all is going well in your life, no matter what kind of barriers have stood in the way. We hope that you're finding your way and into some blessed moments in these very different times in which all of us are living. The sermon series is Unexpected Blessings. We're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. Sandy and I are doing that alternatively. Today we're looking at Blessed Are the Merciful. We hope that you'll be deeply blessed by that message. And before we receive that, let us receive now the gift of marvelous music with Larry Loeber. Our scripture today is taken from the fifth chapter of Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Try this on for size. To refuse mercy to another is to burn a bridge over which you will need to pass one day yourself. George Herbert said that. 
It's kind of saying that um, who of us cannot say the same for ourselves, the need for mercy. Mercy and forgiveness were entrusted to the church as its first and last task. And throughout history, mercy has been mostly buried under the heavy fist of judgment. I don't think God is too amused by that. When we speak of the God of mercy, many people have said to me, why have I never heard this before in the church? God's full acceptance of all people. The good news in the New York Times, despite initial resistance on the part of some bishops, Francis, that is Pope Francis, received wide support for a, and I quote, a fundamental plank of the pontificate, which is mercy. In other words, they were complimenting him for including mercy as one of the most important parts of his plank as he accepted the pontificate. He says, now we can go forward only to the degree that we keep mercy as the first and last word of the church. If the church is to represent the heart of Jesus, it will be known as a place of mercy, not judgment. C.G. Jung, who was trained by uh, uh, Freud, said this, all the men in my family were ministers with a sad bookkeeping and judgmental God. Jung insisted that therapy came along, and I am quoting, Therapy came along because religion had ceased to make mercy its main message. Grace was turned into guilt. We really need to hear that, as hard as those words are. Because of this, said Jung, the gods have left the church and will never return. That's a fancy way of saying your church is dead any time that you do not act upon the central message of the church which is mercy. The great tragedy above all tragedies, I think, is the fact that the church turned mercy into a system of brownie points and bookkeeping. And again, I say, and I don't believe that God is amused by that at all. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. There is the translation by Eugene Peterson. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being full of mercy, you find yourselves receiving the same. Jesus gave us physical laws of the universe. The most important one is do not judge others in order that you are not judged. Peterson says, don't pick on people, jump on their failures, criticize their faults, unless of course you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging is the modern translation of Peterson. Here are some do's and don'ts for the church entrusted with the message of mercy. And I pray to God that we'll get on with being a place that's recognized as a place of mercy more than judgment. Here are the don'ts. Don't make God's unconditional love conditional. Yeah, There's great excitement in the 1980s when John Powell said, love is either conditional or unconditional. Either I attach conditions to my love or I do not. It's that simple. To the extent that I do attach conditions, I do not really love you. I am only offering an exchange, not a gift. And true love is and always will be a free gift. The voice of God was echoed well in the life of a minister turned, uh, who turned his gift Toward children, you know him well, Mr. Rogers. I like you just the way you are. Here's a minister in a Lutheran church turning to children, recognizing that they needed some basic examples of what it means to live after the gospel that he learned about in seminary. The second uh, don't is don't make the Beatitudes rules. You know, these, these beatitudes, these unexpected blessings, they're blessings, they're not rules. Hey, if you don't do this, you know, you're really going to be in trouble, especially in heaven. Andrew Greeley reminds us that the beatitudes were not a new set of rules. Jesus came to teach that rules are of little use 
in our relationship with God. We do not coerce God's love by keeping rules, since that love is a freely given starting point of our relationship with God. That's where you start and end. Greeley continues. We may keep rules because all communities need rules to stay together and because as ethical beings we should behave ethically. But that, according to Jesus, is a minor part of our relationship with God. Nonetheless, some Christians early on went back to the rule game, which attempted to make the Beatitudes converted into new rules, much tougher than those that were revealed by Moses. It's as if they were saying, all right, ours is a much tighter religion, this Christian religion. Let's get going. God is not amused by the mess that we have made of the message of mercy that has been entrusted to us. So another one, don't forget where you came from. Rodney Stark uh, wrote in his book called The Rise of Christianity, how the obscure marginal Jesus movement became the dominant religious force in the Western world in a few centuries. That's a big subtitle. He says it's because mercy. Mercy was the primary virtue of the faith and still is. A merciful God requires humans to be merciful. God is pleased by us loving one another. This mercy must go beyond family and tribe. This mercy belongs to those who don't belong to us. That is the revolutionary message that made an obscure, marginal Jesus movement the dominant religious force in a short period of time. And then someone decided to make the Jesus movement into a business. A business. Uh, many of the mistakes made in the Christian faith is that we made it into a business that looks like this one. Uh, I heard about a man at work and he uh, began his job there and the boss came to him and says, now you begin with 100 points. If you do something bad, two points come off. Get to 80 points and you're fired. And the guy then asked, coming on the job new, and how can you get points? The answer, you can't. That is what the church made of the mercy of God. So do we abandon the faith because some have misused and abused it? Of course not. That would be cop out. There are some things to do in our time. We need to seek a second opinion from writers, poets, and artists in matters of mercy. I remember this woman a long time ago, quite wealthy, wanted an oil painting made of her image. Wealthy people could afford that, so they bring in a famous artist. And so she said, I want you to paint this for me. So she had several sittings and uh, he was finishing up on it and then he took it away and then he brought it to her and then uh, presented it to her. And she looked at it and said, well, the portrait is kind of nice, but it it does not do me justice. And the artist said, uh, lady, you don't need justice, you need mercy. The agnostic Kurt Vonnegut, love him. He was, he was preaching in a Unitarian church uh, on Palm Sunday. And he said this of the Sermon on the Mount. I'm enchanted by the Sermon on the Mount. Being merciful, it seems to me, is the only good idea that we have received so far on this earth. Perhaps we will another uh, day get another idea that would be good by and by, and then we will have two good ideas. Right now we just have one, it's mercy. What might that second good idea be? He says, I don't know, but I will make a wild guess that it will come from music somehow. Robert Frost was being interviewed on uh, radio back in 1956. Ultimately, he said, this is what you go before God for. You've had bad luck and good luck and all you really want in the end, in the presence of God, is mercy. 
You know, you could tell the story of mercy even if you haven't received it. You know, oftentimes people will write about things that they want more than things that they have or they feel they even deserve. Ernest Hemingway was that person, I believe. Ernest told a wonderful story about Paco. There is a Spanish father who seeks reconciliation with his son Paco. They had some kind of falling out a long time ago and his father in his, his older years is feeling grief for that and wants to reconcile. And so this father took out an ad in El Liberal, the newspaper. And in there, in large letters, it said, Paco, meet me at Hotel Montaña at noon on Tuesday. All is forgiven. Signed, Papa. Now, Paco, in Spanish, and in Spain is a name very common. It's like John here, just like that common name. And when the father arrived at the hotel, there were 800 young men named Paco waiting for their father's forgiveness. There's some piece of Paco in every human being that I have ever met in need of some part of, in some part of their soul for the realization of mercy and forgiveness. But here's what I got to tell you. Hemingway was writing about his own life. Hemingway was Paco. He grew up with uh, evangelical Christians who put him down. His mother would not see him because of his lifestyle Kind of a wild guy, for sure. She insisted that he send money to support her, which he did. She sent him one time a birthday cake along with the gun his father used to kill himself, which Hemingway finally did in the state of Idaho. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, to be the church of Jesus Christ, whose first and last word is mercy, and not people of bookkeeping and judgment. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others their trespasses. Don't you see how that works? We mumble that thing every week, people. And it's basically telling you that you will not feel forgiven except to the same degree that you forgive other people. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being full of care, you find yourselves cared for. When this is the first and last word of the church, the human family will have for the second time in human history discovered this thing called fire, a fire that cannot be put out. May God bless us on that path. Amen. Will you pray with me? Well, God who gives us the kingdom and invites us to claim it with freedom and joy, show yourself to us and help us to reorient ourselves. For we are too tightly wound, boxed in, prisoners of our illusions and, in the main, a nervous, dreary, and joyless lot most of the time. The goals we seek have robbed us of our wonder, and the machines we worship have reduced us to a crowd of look-alike consumers, like every mall in America. Here on this your day, through the vehicle of praise, grant that what is dead in us may come alive. We thank you for family roots and ties, for the look of trust in the faces of our children, for songs that penetrate the darkest night, 
for hope that will not be absorbed even by our doubt. Drive us by a gnawing hunger for the real and the love that we have seen on the face of Jesus Christ. Help us in these challenging times to find our souls made tall and free again in contemplation of your love. For we dare to pray all these things in the name of the one who taught disciples, and so we are bold to pray the same. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And now may the grace and the mercy and the peace of God that we have seen in the face of Jesus Christ, may the power of that love be in and among all of you is our prayer, both now and forevermore. Amen.